Greetings, TEDxers. I'm grateful to be here with all of you tonight as we all explore the idea of core impact in our lives. The B in my name, Mary B. Lucas, stands for Bicklemeyer. My core impact is and always has been my family. I was born number nine of ten children to John and Mary Bicklemeyer, and when we said our prayers at night, we'd say, God bless Joan, Judy, Johnny, Jimmy, Joey, Jerry, Jeannie, Jane, Mary, and Barbara. And my name's Mary. I was named after my mom. There's a picture of our family right there. You can see me sitting on my dad's lap. I had bangs and buck teeth, and I had my Marsha Brady red crocheted vest on that I was so proud of. And as I sit next to my mom, Mary, you can see her there. My mom was the heart of our family. Um, she was an only child who wanted 10 children. And when she passed away, I inherited her needlepoint that said, a mother is the only person on earth who can have 10 children and yet have all her love. That's the way we felt about my mom, all of us. She was the heart of our family. And my dad, you see him there, I'm sitting on his lap, and it's so funny because I was so much closer to mom growing up as a little girl. I was named after her, and she was that safe haven, the warm mother's love. Dad, he made you work. He was a butcher by trade with an eighth grade education, yet he was the smartest man I ever knew. And I'd like to introduce you to him a little officially now. So there you see him, my dad, John Bicklemeyer. He's the founder of Bicklemeyer Meats in Kansas City, Kansas. It's still today, 60 plus years later, after he opened his doors, a thriving business in the Armourdale district of KCK. So here my dad was, depression, had to, after graduating from eighth grade, had to come into Kansas City to help raise money for his siblings. His mother died at the age of 42, and he was one of 10 children. And he had to work hard his whole life. So when you look at him, I want you to kind of visualize him. You can see him in the picture. He had these big, dark brown eyes. And he had these really huge, really gnarly hands from working all of his life. And he was kind of a bear of a guy. Um, if any of you have ever seen that movie Up, you know the movie Up? You know Ed Asner, who has the voice of the, of the old man in the movie Up? He would be a perfect cartoon character of my dad. If they ever made a movie of my dad's story, that um, Ed Asner could play my dad. And I'm kind of thinking if they ever make a movie of this story, that um, Cameron Diaz should be me. Don't you think? That would be good. <laughs> I'd be good with that. Okay. So picture this now. Okay. At our family home, the gathering place, the place everybody went, was the butcher block table. My dad went to the butcher supply store and bought a big old butcher block, and he brought it home and put it in the kitchen. He told my mom, this is where we're going to have people over. This is where we're going to sit. And by day, he'd dish out bacon and ground beef at the market, and by night, he would share food for thought and inspiration every chance he got. He loved holding court at the butcher block table. He had this big, booming voice. And I didn't really think my dad could give me much in terms of advice and counsel. When I first graduated from K-State, Kansas State University, I was 22 years old, and I was a little full of yourself, myself. And I don't know if any of you have ever been full of yourself as a 22-year-old or know a 22-year-old. I know one right now, a little full of themselves. I have been related to him. Um, but I was kind of thinking, you know, my dad had an eighth grade education. What could he teach me? You know, I was a college graduate, and I didn't think he could teach me much of anything. Boy, was I wrong. Today, I'm the chief resource officer for Staffmark, one of the largest staffing companies in the world. We're part of the recruit organization. I'm also an accidental author. When my dad passed away, I wrote a book about him. He had a lot of things that he could share with me and that I wanted to share with my family. So when he died, I didn't want his legacy to die. On the tombstone with where my mom and dad are, are, are now, um, the epitaph says, to live in hearts we leave behind means not, means not to die. To live in hearts we leave behind means not to die. I wanted my dad's legacy of sharing that wisdom and that food for thought and inspiration of the butcher block table to live on, so I wrote a book about it. I gave it to my brothers and sisters on what would have been my dad's 90th birthday, and the next thing you know, I'm an intentional communicator. Once you write a book, people want you to go talk about what's in the book. You get invited places. I now get a chance to speak all over the world. And my dad's wisdom is being shared in classrooms and in uh, corporations and in association meetings all over the country, all over the world. I'll be in Ireland this next month. And the reason why, I think, is because it is eighth grade wisdom. It's so basic. In this high tech world, people are hungry for the butcher's wisdom. They want some high touch. They want to remember what it takes to make meaningful connections with people, one person at a time. And that's what my dad taught me. 
And my story really starts, my relationship changed with my dad the day I got my first job. I graduated from K-State, and I'm all full of myself, and I get the phone call, and I answer the phone, and I get offered a job in the staffing industry. And I'm pretty proud of myself. I'm going to wear a suit to the office every day, and I'm going to be one of those people that worked in a corporation. And my dad calls me over to the butcher block table after he hears me accept the position, and he goes, Mary, come on over here. Congratulations. Come on over here. I think I might have a thing or two I can share with you before you start your first day on your new job tomorrow. And I said, all right, Dad rolled my eyes. I was so disrespectful. And he said, Mary, you're going into the people business. And I said, no, Dad, I'm not. I'm going into the staffing industry. <laughs> and he said, Mary, you're going into the people business. He didn't get angry. He got my attention. He looked me deep in the eyes and he said, the people business, that's what you're going into. You're going to find people, working companies, people, that's what you're going to do. And I'm a butcher. And I help people put food on their table. That's what I do. Your mother, she's raising little people to be good people, to live a life of giving back and contributing to their communities. I think we're all in the people business. It doesn't matter what you do for a living, you're in the people business. And if you get out of your own way, girl, and you'd listen to me, maybe I might share a thing or two with you that will help you succeed in the people business too. Because I've done pretty well for myself, I might say. And it was at that moment my relationship changed, and I thought maybe I should listen to him because he was pretty successful. I mean, the guy started an incredible business, was an incredibly successful entrepreneur, and he had a legacy of community involvement and a family that would do anything for him. So maybe I should get out of my own way and listen to him. So I said, all right, Dad, what do you want to tell me? Come on, lay it on me. What do you want to tell me before I start my first day on my new job tomorrow? He said, don't forget the comeback sauce. I said, don't forget the comeback sauce? How does that work in business? He said, it worked for me. I said, well, tell me about it. How did this work for you? He said, well, when I opened the meat market, it was a scary time for me and your mom. I had five mouths to feed, three kids and your mom and me. And I was worried and I was concerned. And I took two guys with me from my former employer. And we opened our doors and we were doing pretty well. And then a couple of months into it, the two guys that worked for me came in one morning. They said, John, we're in trouble. We're in so much trouble. What's the matter, Dad said? We were at Sammy's Bar last night down at 7th Street, and we heard your competitors all meeting there, and they've got a plan to put you out of business. What is it, Dad said? Well, they said, John, that every time you advertise a, advertise a price per pound, they're going to advertise 10 cents per pound cheaper until you can't afford to be in business any longer. And Dad said he looked at him. He didn't really want to laugh, but he couldn't help it. He started laughing. And they said, this isn't funny, John. We came to follow you. We wanted to be part of your startup. This is bad news. And Dad said, guys, no worries. The joke's on them. We don't have any money to advertise. <laughs> All we got is the quality of the product. We sell the roof over our head. What little we pay ourselves. No, 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 wait a minute. Wait a minute. We got something special, boys. We got comeback sauce. You pour the comeback sauce on everybody who comes in here, and we'll be just fine. What do you mean, comeback sauce, Johnny? What are you talking about? I don't know. You figure it out. <laughs> the recipe's different for every customer who comes in here. You have to make one connection at a time. Every customer has a different recipe, so you figure it out. Pour the comeback sauce on them and make sure it's special just for them. I don't understand, Johnny. How am I supposed to do that, one of the guys said. Dad said, all right, let's give an example. The first customer in here this morning, he came in and he walked up to the counter. And you said to him, good morning, how can I help you? He said, I'd like a pound of ground beef. And you said, coming right up. How are you doing today? Not so great. My wife and baby have been sick all week. My wife wants spaghetti red for dinner, so I'm getting this pound of ground beef to, beef to make that for her. And you said, well, all righty, here you go. There you go. Take it on up to the counter and you'll pay for it. Thanks for coming in. It was a fine interaction. There wasn't much comeback sauce on it. Here's what it might have looked like if you would have poured the comeback sauce on that interaction. The first customer comes in. You say, good morning. How can I help you? I'd like a pound of ground beef. You say, how are you doing today? Oh, not so great. My wife and baby are sick. I'm going to make some spaghetti red for them tonight. That's all my wife wants for dinner tonight. You stop what you're doing. You pause. You put everything you're doing down. You, you look him in the eye. And you say, I'm sorry your wife and baby are sick. Sounds like it's been a tough week for you. You know what? Maybe somebody ought to do something nice for you today. What do you think? Here, here's your pound of ground beef. Stop. Go into the cooler. Take a little extra. Top it off. Wrap it up and say, here, I gave you a little extra. 
because I'm going to do something nice for you since you're doing something nice for your family. Go on up there. You'll pay for your pound, nothing more. And come back and see us and know that we'll always take care of you. And I hope your wife and baby feel better. Was that interaction a little different, Dad said? Yeah. Everybody deserves a little comeback sauce. And I started thinking about how my dad could help me throughout my career with these little bits of wisdom. I even took notes. After I wrote the book, Lunch, Meat, and Life Lessons, Sharing a Butcher's Wisdom, because everybody's hungry for butcher's wisdom, it seems, these days, I started taking notes. And I started thinking about, OK, what can I share? What can I, what can I? And I thought, you know what? When, when you write a book, people want you to come talk about the book. And everybody said, come tell our teams about the comeback sauce. What's the recipe for that? I thought, I don't know. One day I thought, well, you know what Dad said? Basically, comeback sauce is different for everybody. The ingredients might be a little different, but the recipe is similar. One part recognition. I'm sorry, your wife and baby are sick. One part connection. You know what? Somebody ought to do something nice for you for a change. Add a dose of the unexpected. I don't know. You'll figure it out, Dad said. Yep, it gave him a little extra. That's what the recipe for comeback sauce, and everybody deserves a little comeback sauce, don't they? This works in your personal and your professional life. I have two sons right now, and they like their comeback sauce in the form of a $20 bill. <laughs> and sometimes they get it in the form of, thank you for being you, and I love you, and I'm proud to be your mother. Comeback sauce is different. It depends on the moment, depends on the time. Everybody deserves a little. So it was that moment that I really changed my relationship with my dad, and it was the basis for the book I wrote, Lunch, Meat, and Life Lessons. And every time I'd go back to the butcher block, I'd walk away with some little bit of wisdom. And I, there's so many, I can't share them all to you in this short time with our TEDx talk. But what I do want to share is a couple little bits of wisdom for you to take away with you as you figure out your own life's path. And maybe you can take into heart some of my dad's wisdom, too. So, for example, when I had a customer who was impossible to work with, I mean, none of you have ever had it to work with anyone you didn't like, right? Well, I did, and she was an impossible customer, and I went to whine about her to dad at the butcher block. He said, Mary, your, your solution's simple. You don't like your biggest customer. It would be out if you lost her, right? This would be bad news. Yes. Okay, well, then your solution is simple. Go back to your office and find the like. If you don't like somebody, they don't like you. So you got to work at finding like, dig deep enough. Doesn't matter no matter who it is. You, if you dig deep enough, if you ask questions that bring out the best in people, you'll eventually find something good in them. You got two ears and one mouth for a reason. Listen twice as much as you talk. Ask questions that bring out the best. When I almost derailed my entire career, when I think about what a baby I was, it was my birthday, the first year I had my job. And everybody forgot it at work. And I was so upset. I was driving home crying. I said, I'm going to resign tomorrow. They don't respect me. They don't, they don't like me. They, don't, they didn't even remember my birthday. I got to my house. My mom made my special dinner for my birthday. And I walked in, and Dad said, how's your birthday going? I said, it's not at all. Everybody at my office forgot my birthday. And he said, no sympathy here. If you don't have a happy birthday, it's your own damn fault. <laughs> you should have told him a week ahead of time, it's my birthday on Tuesday. You should have told him the day before, tomorrow's my birthday. What are we going to do? You should have told him the morning of your birthday, it's my birthday. If you are going to complain and whine about not having a happy birthday, it is your own damn fault. And no matter what I did, Dad would always remind me that I was responsible for my own feelings, my own reactions. He's always saying, nobody makes you happy but yourself. And he'd say, you know, the only way you can change how you view the world is to change how you view the world. Get out of your own way, he'd always say. And there were times in my life when I would kind of like, oh, I'd look at it and say, all right, can I really deal with this? Can I really deal with that? And Dad would say, don't take life so seriously. You're never going to get out of it alive anyway. <laughs> None of us will. That's the way it is. And it's funny, sometimes I would get off focus, and I would get so scattered, and I'd be whining about something. And he'd, again, he'd say, you know, get out your blinders and put them on. Workhorses wear blinders for a reason, so they don't let stuff come in that shouldn't and don't let stuff go out that shouldn't. They wear blinders to focus on the destination where they're headed. You need to get your focus back on. Get out your blinders and put them on. And I think one of my favorites was when he told me, and I was getting really, I was, my, I was climbing the corporate ladder. I was doing so well. And my dad said, Mary, I'm so proud of you, just as I am all my children. We were always reminded that we were part of something bigger than ourselves, the Bicklemeyer family. I never got the spotlight just on me. He said, you I'm worried about. What are you worried about? I said. 
worried about you because you're doing so well. Don't get all wrapped up in yourself because when you're all wrapped up in yourself, you make a damn small package. <laughs> And the last story I want to share with you, and I think the bit of wisdom that's the most powerful for me, is the story of my dad's last day. My dad was diagnosed with congestive heart failure. It was a busy time in my family. My sister was very ill. She was going to die at any time as well. My family was scattered all over, and I don't know how it happened, but I found myself alone on the day before my father passed away in the intensive care unit with him at the hospital. And he'd poured the comeback sauce on all the nurses. And it was funny, because he was sitting across from me, and he was right about where you are. And he looks over at me, and I'm kind of struggling in the chair. I'm thinking, oh my gosh, I can't believe this is happening. My mom passed away. Things were happening in my family that I think all of us were struggling with. And Dad looks over at me as I'm sitting in the chair, always looking out for me. He said, Mary, you look so uncomfortable. I am uncomfortable. And he said, all right, and his voice got really soft. And he raised that big gnarly hand that I told you about, and he patted himself on the shoulder. He said, come on up here, snuggle with me like you did when you were a little girl, like I did in that picture. He said, nobody will care. These nurses love me. Come on up, snuggle with me. Pass the time with me. I climbed up into his bed. I put my head on his shoulder, and I lost it. I just started to cry. And he could feel it. He could feel me crying. And he looked down at me, and I could feel him looking down at me, and he said, Mary, Mary, really, are you okay? And I looked up at him, and I said, no, Dad, I'm not. I'm crying now. Are you really okay? And I'll never forget what he said. He said, yes, I'm proud of who I am and what I've done. I like what I see in the mirror. If this is how it ends, then this is how it ends. I'm ready for this. I've spent my whole life preparing for this. And I looked at him, and because it's always all about me, I said, good for you. <laughs> good for you. So happy for you, Dad. But what am I going to do? What am I going to do now? And he sa I said, who's going to inspire me now when you go away? Where am I going to go for inspiration? And he looked down at me, and without missing a beat, he said, Mary, your mother and I have taught you well. Inspire yourself. You'll figure it out. Inspire yourself. And that, I believe, is an idea we're sharing. Inspire yourself. Inspire yourself. Thank you. <laughs>